this episode. Podsterons produce plots of peril. Spectrum Scarlet starts shipping. Chris can't quite comprehend his chance choice. And Jamie chats to writer Ray Earl. Oh, that's all coming up in Pod 70. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> Look, here we are again. You say that every time, Richard. Pod 70 it's like of Jerry Anderson Podcast. <laughs> well, neither can our listeners. I'm Jamie Anderson, you are. I'm Richard James. Welcome to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Here we are for the next all oh, hour and a bit with, um, well, some of the usual stuff and some new things, of course, that I'm very excited about. Oh, yeah. Hey, come on. I mean, yay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, do you mean the plot of peril? The plot of peril. We have literally been deluged with <laughs> a few answers. Yeah. Deluged with literally single figures uh, of yes. plots. Yeah. Hey, but it's a slow burn. I think once people get the hang of it, there'll be no stopping them. Absolutely. So, and yes. we've got some good entries to We have. So we'll be looking at your plots of peril a little later on. Also, we've got, of course, some Jerry Anderson news because there's always interesting and new stuff happening in the Jerry Anderson universe. We've got uh, Chris Dale's amazing randomizer coming a little later on. Uh, we've got some comments from our listeners as well via Twitter and email and uh, Facebook. And finally, of course, the first part of... A rather interesting interview, Jamie. Yes. So it's with Ray Earl, mm. who is a writer, creator, creative human, author type person. You may know her as the creator of My Mad Fat Diary, which I think was on E4 a couple of years ago. She's all sorts of other bits and pieces, currently working on a kid's show, which we talk about. Yep. But we met in the Twitterverse because she got involved in the space war that we had uh-huh. for Space 1999 <laughs> yes, time. I can't finish. remember why we did it, but we had a space war with a big finish and that's how we got chatting. So it's two parts. She's a Captain Scarlet obsessive and it's a nice fun chat. Great. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Look forward to that. Talking about obsessives, did anyone out there enjoy Terrorhawks Day and the stream <laughs> via the uh, Jerry Anson YouTube channel? And Big Finish, I think, got involved as well. Yeah, Big Finish did a, a nice offer, yeah. but we had a repeating pattern of six tele-episodes and three audio episodes done throughout the day. Nice. And um, lots of people diving and going, oh my God, I haven't seen this or heard this yeah. since the 80s. <laughs> That's right. So huge sort of shovel boatloads, boatloads of nostalgia. Yeah. Shovel loads didn't sound enough. No, no, no. Yeah, so that's been really fun to see and to get involved with a bit. I've been on there diving in and out, chatting and stuff. But... Uh, we're recording this on Terror Hawks yes. Day, of course, but by the time listeners hear this, I shall be in Cannes, oh, right. in the okay. south of France, doing some, you know, MIPCOM, uh. which is the kind of telly industry, yeah. salesy, pitchy yeah. thing. Yeah. So we'll be recording from there next week, Richard, so listeners can expect a dip in sound yeah. quality okay. and possibly content yeah. for podcasts. Right. I mean, I have no where, where are you going to be? Well, just be at home washing my hair, I think. But yeah. Anyway, you have a nice time in Cannes. Yeah. yeah put some sun cream on. Don't get too burnt. Yeah. Well, at least you can wash your hair, Richard, eh? <laughs> <laughs> now, I was going to say, if you did watch the uh, Terror Hawks stream on Terror Hawks Day, do let us know what you thought. Did it rekindle some old memories or were you new to it? Did you come new to Terror Hawks? Imagine that. Mm. And if so, what did you think? Do drop us a line at podcast at uh, jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll read out your email next time. Yes. Or just do a tweet with the hashtag Terror Hawks Day. Oh, yeah. Great. And we'll find you that way. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well... That's old news. It, it we is, yeah, now. T- we, should we touch on some new news and more current news? Oh, yeah. In Go the on. Jerry Anderson news? Go on, then. Okay, here it is. What is it, Richard? It's newsy, news, news, news. Yeah, thanks, as everyone's come to expect. Now, you just mentioned Terror Hawks Day. Yep. So, of course, for Terror Hawks Day, we released some new bits of Terror Hawks merch, 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 mm-hmm. all designed by the incredibly talented and rather marvellous Chris Thompson. We've got a Zeroids and Cubes design, which is very smart indeed. Terror Hawks vehicles design, where they're all blasting out of a launch bay, which is quite similarly shaped, oh. you might think, to the Terror Hawks emblem. Okay. And 
a third design with said Terrorhawks emblem on the front of tees and hoodies and yeah. mugs and all sorts. Mm-hmm. So pop along there and grab those. We mentioned the Thunderbirds pin badges a couple of weeks ago for Thunderbirds Day, which were delayed, but they are now in stock. Oh, lovely. They're a, a rather snazzy, contemporary, sort of Roundel-type design, yeah. but they're very cool. As Richard alliteratively alluded to right. <laughs> wow. in the opening. Well done, you. Oh, is that right? Goodness me, that's tough to say. Uh, Captain Scarlet from Big Chief Studios is now shipping. In fact, if you pre-ordered him, you may already have him in your collection, in your... Ooh, do send us a picture. Mr. On Mitts. Mm, yeah. I can't help but be alliterative today. <laughs> uh, if you have pre-ordered, he should now be with you or winging his way to you. Mm-hmm. If you only put a deposit down, then make sure you've paid your deposit balance by the 25th of October. All right. There are quite a few of you who, unfortunately, have yet to pay that remaining amount. Right. And he's in high demand. So Scarlet has sold out, pre-sold out, Mm. but uh, we'll have to return him to stock if you don't sort that out by the 25th of October. That sounds really mean, but we we can't just have him sitting there and he's in high demand. That's right. So if you didn't manage to pre-order one and you do want a Captain Scarlet 6 scale figure from Big Chief Studios, then keep an eye on the website. And uh, if more become available then we will let you know and if you're really 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 desperate email support at jerryanderson.co.uk and tim and louise will take note of your request and email you directly when scarlet comes back into stock although there is a waiting list oh okay so, of course there is and it's very much first come first served. yes so keep an eye on the store i'm looking forward to getting mine at some point mm, oh, you know. it looks very it looks very cool mm. yeah and we've had a couple of posterons write in with a couple of news item reminders, Richard, which oh, is lucky lovely. because I'd forgotten these things. <laughs> yeah, good. So Matthew Alderman Harris, one of our young listeners, younger listeners, yeah. has written in and he said, I thought you might be interested to hear that Series 2, Episode 6 of the Great Model Railway Challenge on Channel 5 featured a Thunderbirds-themed layout, which included the Tracy Villa and Thunderbird 1 being transported to its launch bay before blasting out the swimming pool. Oh, lovely. So I think that's already been out, but if you are in the UK, then you can probably re-watch that yeah. on whatever Five on demand, service is now. Called, is yes. it Demand 5? No, something like that, yes, that's right. Yeah. They've definitely got a catch-up service. Yeah, yeah, so you can watch it there. Mm. And Terry from Hereford has emailed to remind us that Space 1999, which has been on Forces TV for some time, yeah. is now on the Horror Channel. Oh. And you can catch it weekday evenings from 8pm and Saturdays there's a double bill at 1pm. Right. That's correct at the time of speaking. Yes. And you can watch the Horror Channel on Sky Channel 317, Virgin 149, Freeview 70 or Freesat 138. Great. Now, it is about time one of these channels had a dedicated Anderson slot, really. They do, I know, do very good things showing UFO in Space 1999. But wouldn't it be wonderful if they set aside, I don't know, an evening a week from 9pm to show something specifically, maybe start from the very beginning? Have a whole Anderson season. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Start from the very beginning with a 10-minute episode of Twizzle. <laughs> yeah, why mean. not? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, let's not start there. Okay. Let's start with the sci-fi stuff. Start with Supercar. Yeah, or maybe Sorry the colour stuff, stuff or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That would be great, wouldn't yeah. it? Well, people keep saying, oh, why isn't there a Jerry Anderson channel sure. and all that sort of stuff? And, you know, yeah. maybe one day. Yeah, who knows? Part of the problem is, that, and this, we have this all the time with um, questions about DVDs and Blu-rays. It's not old-fashioned necessarily, but there's this thing of stuff being carved up between different territories yeah. you know some shows get sold to one place in the US and then they leave one out and that gets given to another yeah. North American distributor and then not all the stuff gets bought in Australia and New Zealand and it gets split all over the place and so not everybody has access to stuff it would be really really nice to have a central streaming service where everybody could grab Absolutely. whatever Jerry Anderson show they wanted of course that would so be wonderful maybe one day yeah. maybe one day exactly yeah Let's see. Anyway, that is the end. That weird little tangential bit at the end definitely brings us to the end (laughs) of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. I don't think people realise quite how clever I'm being when I do that, Jamie, because I'm not actually doing it to the music. No. It's overlaid Which explains why it's often out of tune. Oh. But that that particular one, though, I thought was really nice. You've been practising, I think. Thanks. Have you been singing in the shower? (laughs) Well, have you been watching? (laughs) <laughs> um, if you have any news that you think Jamie might have forgotten, do email us in at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. It could be about an event in your local area, something you're doing yourself, or if you spot a, a broadcast of a particular show on a particular channel, do let us know. On a similar theme, Jamie, Mark Simpson Wedge, of course, who we know well, is over on YouTube as Dalek Sram. Have you seen his latest uh, his game show that he's uploaded over the last few days? I have. So I'd heard about this yes. from some of our lovely team, mm-hmm. from Chris and AC. 
saying that this game was played and I should keep an eye out for the edit. Anyway, Mark has emailed in, and yes, I've managed to watch a few minutes of it. Yeah. It's fun. Um, and it's great. Yeah. Really good. It sounds like they had real fun. So well done, Mark. Very creative. Uh, if you want to watch that Jerry Anderson game show, then I guess pop along to Mark's YouTube channel. Yeah. Just go to YouTube and search for Dalek Sram. That's right. It's really good fun. But yeah, maybe there'll be a live opportunity to play that game once again. Oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Or those set of games. Yeah. yeah, it'd be great. Maybe if there's a Fab Worlds of Anderson next year, we oh. could do it live on the stage. Are you what saying do you reckon? that there will be a Fab, live, uh, Fab Worlds of Anderson next year? I'm not saying that at all, Richard. I'm just, you know, making an educated guess. <laughs> now, people have been uh, tagging us over on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast. They've also been uh, tagging I'm Jamie Anderson and me, Richard N. James, so that we see their tweets. A couple of weeks back, we asked, or I asked rather, to let us know if you've seen any other Anderson-related actors or props or even craft in other shows. And a few people have got in touch. Jeff Owen over on Twitter said you were asking about references to Jerry Anderson Productions in other shows. The Eagle Transporter from Space 1999, of course, appears in an episode of Red Dwarf, Series 6's Sirens, apparently. Mm. Yeah. Isn't it embedded in an asteroid or something? That's right, exactly. Yeah. I think it's sort of blink if you miss it, but it's there. And uh, Heather Ballard, over on our Podstorons Facebook group, said, Captain Scarlet's Francis Matthews hosted a series of educational videos teaching English. I think this is in the 1980s? Anyway, she says the whole series is up on YouTube, so I did a bit of a dig around, and I've had a little clip, Jamie. Do you want to have a listen to this? I would love nothing more. Here's... Francis Matthews. Hello, I'm Francis Matthews. My name's Francis Matthews. Look, Francis Matthews. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. You're Richard James. <laughs> Look, Richard James. There. Isn't that amazing? That's hilarious, isn't it? Great to hear that voice. I, I once did a, um, a, a corporate uh, video for Bradford and Bingley, who I think were an old estate, uh, not a state agent, um, a um, building society. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know it was going to be broadcast anywhere until I got a message from my sister-in-law saying, I've just been into my local branch of Bradford and Bingley and there you were on the screen telling me where to put my money. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, we all do these things. Simon Allen also brought up uh, Michael Sheard, mentioned him on Facebook, who of course appeared in Space 1999 and just about everything else from Doctor Who to Grange Hill and Indiana Jones and all sorts of stuff. So there you go, actors, props, even craft from Jerry Anderson shows. They get around, <laughs> don't they? They take the work where they can get they it, yeah. They do, exactly. Yeah, there we are. Uh, Richard? Yes? I am quite excited about something. I, I thought it was just the way you were sitting. <laughs> Too much coffee, yes, that's part yes. of the reason. But the other reason is because last week you introduced something rather special. It's true, and I've got it here with me under its cover. Okay, yeah. well, do you... I mean, actually, should we wait to pull off the cover? Yeah. Okay, f for now, yeah. let's... Have a read and a listen to mm. some of the entrance for the very first ever Plot of Peril. Yes, it's the Plot of Peril. It's the part of the podcast where I give you three items from the Jerry Anderson universe. And it's up to you, because we know a lot of people love a bit of fan fiction and writing their own adventures. It's up to you to string those three things together into a fairly coherent plot from a Jerry Anderson show of your own choosing. Pop it in an email use it as an audio message, pop it on the Facebook group, or even tweet it, as some people have done. No longer than about 30 seconds long, and I'll read out the winner next time. So, if you remember, the plot device last week gave us these three things. They were Thunderbird Scott Tracy, a length of garden hose, and the location was the Sydney Opera House. And I have to say, the entries were fantastic. So thank you, Angus Dusk, who emailed in a uh, rather nice dialogue-heavy bit of action. Simon Allen on the Facebook group as well put his uh, version up. We also had Elliot Webb sent us an email with his ideas. And Simpsons Clips 24 over on Twitter hashtagged us Plot of Peril, and he posted his there so you can see it as well. But I have to say, the winner for this week has to be Jack Knoll, who really went above and beyond the call of duty, pulled out all the stops, and to send us something really rather special. Yeah. So here is Jack's audio file for The Plot of Peril. 
Hello gentlemen, this is Jack, and this is my contribution to this week's Plot of Peril. So, it's Virgil's birthday on Tracy Island, and Scott is a very nice older brother, so he has arranged to take Virgil on a special treat. They are going to a concert at the Sydney Opera House. I mean, what better present for Virgil, who is as we all know, such a music lover. So they go to the show, and they're having a magnificent time, and Virgil is particularly having a very nice time, and is enjoying uh, one or two drinks at the bar at the interval. And, oh, well, he has one or two too many orange juices, shall we say, and ventures outside of the building, and he goes out to take in the, the sea air and enjoy the view of the Sydney Harbour and look up at the bridge, and, oh, what a magnificent sight. Unfortunately, he gets a little bit too close to the barrier at the edge of the water and he falls over it and he slips over and he falls into the water and he's having a little bit of problem swimming because as we all know Gordon is the expert swimmer um, among the international rescue team but fortunately Scott has been helping Carano out with the gardening on Tracy Island that particular day and he still has in his pocket a length of garden hose which Carano had discarded because it was getting old and worn out but would it be strong enough to hold Virgil as Scott throws it over the side into the water for Virgil to grab? It's creaking and it's buckling but just about it's able to support Virgil's weight as Scott pulls Virgil back up over to the side. And Virgil goes in to enjoy the rest of the show, feeling a bit silly and in sopping wet clothes. So, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Ah, uh, Poor Virgil. Nice work, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, since Virgil's a bit of a hero of mine, I, I can't imagine that he would have really had one too many orange juices no. at half time. No, that would never happen. At the happen. bar, but... I have to say also, that was all bells and whistles from Jack, so thank you for that. We don't expect that every time. Very happy with just an email or a Facebook group for this week's. For example, Simon Allen, <laughs> where his uh, entry on the Facebook page was, uh, Sydney Opera House is on fire. Scott is searching through Pod 5 for a hose, but Alan has borrowed it to go down to the Swinging Star. Scott must then borrow a garden hose from a local to put out the fire. That's it. Nice. Short and sweet. Yeah. Short and sweet. Is Simon then our runner-up? Simon could be this week's runner-up. Not that there are any prizes involved at all. No, no. <laughs> Right. But thank you all for your entries. Now, Richard, uh, time for you to unveil the plot yeah. device yeah. This, for this week and do the... the uh... Ah, there it is. That's a big heavy yeah. cover that you've got. Well, have you got a new specially fitted one? Yes, I have. Yeah, I had it sewn specially. Uh, right, nice. so here we are. So this is this week's plot of peril. I'm going to use the plot device here to give you a character from the Jerry Anderson universe, a random item, and a location. And it's up to you to string them all together in a fantastic plot of peril. Are you ready? So the character is... Joe 90. The random item is... A shopping trolley. And the location... Oh, the dark side of the moon. There we are, Potstrongs. <laughs> There's your plot of peril. Can you string Joe 90, a shopping trolley, and the dark side of the moon into something resembling a coherent plot? Pop it in an email to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Pop it on our Podstrons uh, Facebook uh, listeners group, or even pop on over to Twitter. Hashtag it, plot of peril. And I will see it there, and I shall unveil the winner next week. I can hardly contain my excitement. <laughs> Once more with feeling. <laughs> and I'll save it for next week. I don't, wanna, I don't want to get rid of it all now. <laughs> Very nice, Richard. Thank you. And I, you know, I cannot wait if we do have another Fab Worlds of Anderson yeah. visit where we do a live appearance for you to unveil the real yes. plot device live on stage. If I can get it in the car. Yes. I mean, it's quite <laughs> hefty, isn't it? It might is. have to get on a roof rack. It might be, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> what a marvellous new segment that is. I'm sure people are, you know, itching to send their country in. Pins poised. <laughs> I can see them now. Yeah. Uh, perhaps actually we should send the the most recent three picks from the plot device to our interview guest ah. since she's a writer yes of course see what she comes up with so who's this then Jamie so this week Richard mm -hmm. our podcast guest is Ray Earl yes Ray is English but she lives in Tasmania cool does she yeah wow so it was quite interesting to try and sync up things for the call I see yes she is a writer best known for My Fat Mad Teenage Diary. Okay. Which was then, I think, published in the US as My Mad Fat Diary uh -huh. for some 
titular reason. Yeah. I don't know why. No. But it was made into my Mad Fat Diary on E4 back in 2013, 2014, 2015. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you may well have seen that. But she's written some non-fiction stuff, including a book called It's All In Your Head, A Guide to Getting Your <clears throat> Together. Okay, sounds good. Sounds like we all might we do that. We, we keep it clean here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and she's working on some kids stuff right now. But anyway, as I said, we got together because of a space war on Twitter. Turns out she's a huge Captain Scarlet fan. So we kind of dive pretty much straight into Captain Scarlet, why she loves oh, it. Great. She defends it uh-huh. quite strongly uh-huh. when I start to pick holes in wow. it. Wow. You know, it, just for fun, just to kind of stress test her fandom of yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we had a really lovely chat. So this is part one of my chat with Raelle. Hello, my name is Ray Earl. I'm a writer and a broadcaster, and I've been in love with both Captain Scarlet and uh, Captain Blue for about 35 years. Gosh, (laughs) what (laughs) revelation to start thinking. Uh, I think by the end of this, you're going to have to pick one or the other, but let's let's navigate our way through the whole thing first, but I'm going to hold you to deciding a proper ranking between Scarlet and Blue by the end. Okay. (laughs) No pressure. I think it's probably worth just mentioning how this conversation has happened. Why are we now speaking, Ray? Beautifully, and it was one of these beautiful quirks of of fate and one of the ways social media can be wonderful. I got involved in a space war on Twitter (laughs) and um, it was delicious. And I saw that various people were trying to outdo each other with various characters from very prestigious sci-fi series from the years. And I just, for me, the definitive villain of all science fiction on television that I can think of, for me, is Captain Black. Because he just kills everyone and reconstructs them. And when you corner him, he disappears. And he is truly terrifying to a young mind when he's standing in a graveyard and getting closer and closer to a dum 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 soundtrack. So... That's how it started, this lovely thing. That's how it started. So it's fair to say that you're a Captain Scarlet super fan. I, look, I'll give my history with it. My nan lived in an old people's complex that had a really bizarre television aerial. And we could get, bear with this, it's relevant. We could get, she could get rather, three ITV regions. She could get Central, ATV, but then Central, Anglia, I said that right for a change. And at a push, if you twiddled the knob, Yorkshire, but the picture would roll, but the sound would be okay. So at some point in the 80s, you could watch, because of regional differences on ITV, I could watch Captain Scarlet like twice on one day just by having a quick twiddle of the knob (laughs) because of my nan's fantastic aerial. And because of that, I just became, I mean, I haven't got it anymore, but I made a list of episodes and like marked them out of 10, like wrote down what went on in them because I was just I'd never seen as a child anything so dark and (laughs) ambiguous and you know we'd grown up on Thunderbirds I'd watched Thunderbirds and I'd loved it but Captain Scarlet seemed to be such a right off the road right off Junction 27 I mean where's that going and (laughs) I, I just adored it and then I had this such a beautiful memory and I will defend this till the day I die. It's the only time I've ever seen it was all a dream or all a nightmare played out well. Attack on Cloudbase is singularly, I think, one of my favourite, in my top 10 favourite bits of television ever. I think it is beyond perfect because there was no internet then. There was no spoilers. I thought that was the last episode. <laughs> so when Colonel, I did. And I was absolutely beside myself. When Colonel White was spinning round, I couldn't believe what I was seeing because the writers and your dad had put me in a position as a kid where I absolutely believed there could be a bad ending. And that has stayed with me all nice. my life. I just thought it was wonderful. I thought it had a truth to it as well. I don't know if it spoke to my dark adolescent self. <laughs> I was early teens by this stage, but it just had such a truth to it. I adored it. It's one of the first things I brought on iTunes. And I have it on, and every so often I'll watch it and it'll still thrill. Thank I have you. to say, the bit that I adore is when Captain Blue says, Captain Scarlet's dead. Don't be silly. Don't be silly. There he is. And the doctor's Captain Black. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. This is the, <laughs> the worst thing that's ever happened. Ever. This is just awful. 
this, how are we going to get out of this? This is, oh yeah, it was bad. But so you, great. You, you really, really believed oh, it. I promise you, I can see it now. That never occurred to me it had anything to do with a crashed angel having a nightmare in the desert. Never occurred to me. <laughs> it didn't even come into my consciousness that that could be a possible outcome. I don't know what I thought, but I knew when Colonel White started spinning, I was in meltdown. I just couldn't get my head around it in a great way, in a truly great way. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, clearly you are a fan. You've enjoyed Captain I Scarlet am. to some degree. I get the feeling, Ray. Right? <laughs> but Do you know what? But only about four months ago, I brought the Haynes Manual of <laughs> And I just adore it. Because, and I, I tell you, the Captain, the Captain Black, I love the background of all the characters. And, yeah. and, and it just, again, I just get the feeling that everything in your dad's world was so well thought out and rounded and full. And Captain Black's orphanage backstory, you know, this left during after some big atomic war and... It just, oh, I thought this is even better than I remember it. And it's rare that that happens. Nostalgia is usually rose-tinted. But in this case, it was even, yeah, it is. Inevitably it is, because we forget all the bad bits and we just concentrate on the good bits. But, oh, just wonderful. The the detail is a thrill. I'll be in love forever. forever. Have have you seen the the Blu-ray versions? No, because I haven't got a Blu-ray player. Oh, right. When you get there, you're going to experience Captain Scarlet in a whole new way. It is so beautiful. Where so beautiful. For you? Where does it rank for you? In, ah. in, in... <laughs> well, I'm a bit of a weirdo because I grew up uh, watching Terror Hawks, which is... Oh, well, that's fine. Because I remember that as well and I loved it too. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, we can talk about Terror Hawks too. So that was my first experience. So that was kind of exciting. And then really, it's kind of bizarrely Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet kind of draw in second place, although I know they're so different. But I often found Colonel White to be a bit of a dullard. What? What? Whoa! I, I know, <laughs> I know. I, I think it's because I would watch Thunderbirds and uh, the caricaturing and stuff kind of gave it a separation from reality and a, and a levity that for me, balanced stuff with Jeff Tracy's paternal stuff. But there was a paternal warmth with him where, as with with Colonel White, it was a paternal chill (laughs) with him. And there was no... There was no humour and warmth in the rest of the show to really balance it out other than Scarlet being a bit flirty with the angels. No, this... Whoa, you're missing out on loads of nuance. (laughs) This is just wrong. Okay, tell me about the nuance of Captain Scarlet I'm missing out on. Just think think about Attack on Cloudbase. If that is... Sorry, I forgot which Angel's Dream is. Is it Destiny? I think it's Destiny, yeah. Okay, if this is her dream, then it must to some degree be based on a reality that she's experienced. So Colonel White gets very, very upset in a military style way at the death Mm. of Captain Scarlet. He shows emotion. And Lieutenant Green says, steady, Colonel. And he responds to that and says, thank you. That is, good God. If that happened in an actual drama, like featuring humans, you'd be really touched. This is a guy fighting a war. And he's, you know, he's lost his best soldier and he's lost the plot for just a second. And his subordinate, Lieutenant Green, says, Colonel, you know, you need to just, you know, come on. And he just takes it on board. I think that is beautiful. I honestly do. Okay, well, it's a lovely moment, but it's a dream, Ray. It's like, you know. It's... Yes, but it, dreams must be based to some degree on a subconscious. He must have shown emotion. At some point, remember, we're only seeing half hour of the day of spectrum. I brought into this, you can tell. We're only seeing half hour <laughs> every moment, every time. And I believe in the living quarters of spectrum and they're living on cloud base and everything else. So, look, for me, I saw enough glimpses of humanity. And another thing that I loved was Colonel, where's Captain Black, sorry's backstory, where he was the one with his own impetuous nature and warmongering nature that initiated the the war in the first place. So humans were to blame. Now, when you're living through the Cold War and you're seeing lots of, you know, posturing, that has a real resonance oh, about yeah. it. And, you know, if you're watching that in the mid-80s, good God, that's it feels like puppet real life. 
I don't like using the word puppet. I don't even like to use say puppet show. It seems as a swear word. Well, you can when I'm marination, if you prefer, and that's what I want to say. But I, that's one of those words like angle I struggle with. But <laughs> a non-actor show, though the voices are obviously wonderful. Yeah. I, no, I just I, no Colonel White. Yes, but you're right though. You're totally right. Thunderbirds was very was really cuddly and and. I hate to use the word empowering. God, if my mates hear me call Thunderbirds empowering, they will take the mickey mercilessly. I can <laughs> well, think of now. one in particular that will just ring up and go, Rachel, you called Thunderbirds empowering. But actually, there is something beautiful about a rich bloke on an island, not just buying loads of handbags, but having an international rescue squad to help people in genuine need. Yep, 100%. Now, that, again, that is lovely. The subtext of all of these... Oh, subtext. Ray, I haven't worried myself, but I mean it. It's something... Re- and that's why you can reboot them and they still have relevance because they're universal themes. Absolutely. A positivity and humans doing the right thing with the coolest <laughs> tools available. With the coolest tools available and the best Thunderbird, of course, is Thunderbird 4. Oh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and I've had this argument for years. I've had this argument for years and... I've had enough of having the argument. You're Thunder just Bird stating 4. it as fact now, are you? I'm just stating it as fact now. Thunderbird 4. And, I, and that's where I am. I realise that Thunderbird 2 for a lot of people is, is iconic. But for me, Thunderbird 4 always seemed the coolest. Though, actually, when I look at it now, it, it was probably a natural... Did Stingray come first? It must have done. Yeah, Stingray was pre-Thunderbirds. Yeah, so I do wonder if it's kind of a natural underwater progression. But still, yeah, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Obviously, Thunderbird 4 would be nothing without Thunderbird 2 for the most part because it couldn't get there. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Thunderbird 2 looked pretty pathetic without Thunderbird 4. No, because so... <laughs> it might have had the mole. Anyway. I, no. But anyway, go on. <laughs> We're not going to resolve this sort of no. thing in a, in a podcast conversation. We. Well, they're, they're unresolvable. No... And this, this is part of the lovely thing is there's so much Anderson material out there. People find their own thing that they love. You know, there are people who are devoted to Thunderbirds or Scarlet and say, well, Scarlet's obviously superior because it's more grown up and the puppets are human proportions and I found that more believable and others who say, well, no, Thunderbirds, they're, you know, they're puppets. Why are, you trying, why are you trying to make things human? If it's close to human but misses the mark, then it's not right, is it? It looks weird and takes you out of it. So give me a, give me a take on the puppets. I, well, for me, I never, perhaps it's different now for kids today, but for me, I never struggled with the fact they were puppets at all. Yes, we all no. had a giggle when it showed a hand. Oh, yes, yes, I understand that. Was, yes, I understand that was a, a break from the reality of where we were. But it didn't stop me being completely involved. And I don't know. I think there was Scarlet Puppets, I think. were, But I've since read that people are really mixed about Captain Scarlet, which I'm really surprised about. Because I'm really surprised about that. And you've just kind of vocalised it. To me, I don't get that at all. Am I missing something? <laughs> no, not at all. This is the thing where it, different shows speak to different people. Again, you know, outside of just the, the Scarlet and Thunderbirds thing, there's people who saw Fireball XL5 and think that was the peak <gasps> of Anderson. And there's people who uh, say, no, UFO and Space 1999, forget the puppet stuff. It was the live action that hit it and beyond. Even some people say Terror Hawks is the best, believe it or not, weirdly. Yeah, but I can, I know, but I can understand that. I can absolutely <laughs> understand that. And that had a great soundtrack. And that's another thing your dad shows had, where it's just the best soundtracks, just the yeah. th- iconic theme music. I remember making friends via Fireball XL5 in my 20s. Of course, again, this is pre-internet because I had a lovely friend called Ed and we were talking about, I think probably he, he came from the Granada region and I think the Granada and the Anglia region were quite similar. They showed a lot of old stuff a lot still yeah. right into the 80s. And him and I managed to sing the entire, and this is pre-internet, there was nothing to look at, you have to do everything from memory. We managed to sing the entire end theme of Fireball XL5 from start to finish. Nice. And lyrically perfect. And a friendship was formed off the back of that. I loved Fireball XL5. I mean, yes, it was primitive to me. I could see it was a primitive version of what I was watching, but it had a real, it had real charm. Stingray I loved. Stingray's probably second to me to Scarlet. Okay. Believe it or not. Probably before Thunderbirds, actually. Uh, well, that's though okay. D- that's fine. What was it about Stingray, though, that grabs you? 
I liked the way that Troy looked like James Garner, obviously. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, if you can go from the guy in the Rockford Files is currently saving someone underwater as a super marionation figure, that's a beautiful thing. I loved Atlanta, though I did struggle with Troy's... And I did find this as a girl. I always thought your dad was great, especially for the time with female characters. Mm. I mean, it very easily could have been a, a thoroughly macho world. Yeah. But obviously with Lady Penelope, with the Angels, with Atlanta, you had a strong female presence there. Mm. And I think, you know, you look at it now, and you would write it differently now. Oh, God, yes, going, absolutely. Of course you would. Of course you would. Definitely, what in myriad of ways. But for the time, I remember thinking that was way ahead of its time. Mm. I did struggle with Marina a bit. I thought she was a sap <laughs> and she made me annoyed. And then at the end theme, when the singer said, because you enthrall me so. Yeah. And Atlanta, and Atlanta <laughs> looks at the picture of Troy, but he's completely obsessed with Marina. That did used to annoy me. He I did was a... Sweet- <laughs> oh. <laughs> he was a bit of a duplicitous uh, git, wasn't he? Uh, he was a bit. He led Atlanta on. And considering his, her boss was the dad, I always thought that was a really risky move. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. Um, so, no... <laughs> I did love Stingray as well. But yes, yes. Look, the joy of this is that nobody is wrong. Yeah, and, and these things can go... This is what the internet is for, debating our best Jerry Anderson show. Not for having huge political debate in 140 or 280 characters. That's very difficult on Twitter. True. But discussing Scarlet Thunderbirds XL5, brilliant. Well, do you know, in the weeks before, and possibly during when this interview will play out, Ray, we will have held the Jerry Anderson World Cup on Twitter, uh, where people will be voting for their ultimate best Jerry Anderson show. And obviously, that will be absolute final say, and we will enact the decision of the people on, <laughs> on that favourite. So it may still be going on now. I think the hashtag is GA World Cup. So you can... Okay. You can go there and i know you'll be furiously voting for captain scarlet and trying to get everybody else you know to vote for it but too. i no, i bet i don't win though what one last time uh well we haven't done one but generally thunderbirds <gasps> okay. and space 1999 come in the top two i vaguely it's weird i only vaguely remember space 1999 i don't think that was repeated a lot was it I think that came up more in the 90s and early 2000s they, they, they did several runs of it on itv4 Oh, that okay. was born. But uh, no, I mean, the puppet show has had a resurgence, a little resurgence in the 80s, and then the big resurgence in the early 90s and the 2000s again, particularly yeah, when I, Birds my, and Scarlet. It's funny, when I told my mum that I was speaking to you, she went, that bloody man. <laughs> right, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> bear with me. Right, and please take this in the, you know, in the way it was intended. Absolutely, so when... I really got into Scarlet. And as I say, I was a devotee in the 80s. I really was. I'm a really a geek about it. As much as you could be then, because obviously you didn't realise other teenage girls could be in uh, Jerry Anderson stuff. And you kept it a bit quiet because it wasn't really cool. And you couldn't really find your tribe easily then. But of course, now I know there's millions of us. So that's all brilliant. But I applied to join Fanderson. Yep. And they very sweetly sent back, and you can work out what year this is probably by the price. They sent back, how much it would be and it was seven pounds for the year oh and this is really sweet and it kind of said but at that point we were too skint and don't get me wrong seven quid for the year was completely reasonable there was there was nothing wrong in that price that was a completely reasonable price and most fan clubs were far far more but we just couldn't afford it at that point so i was a bit gutted i was a bit gutted mm. but anyway that's by the by so that's my <laughs> that was where I, I remember getting a little leaflet back it's gorgeous but then my nephew, so my mum's grandsons, hit the 90s resurgence just at the wrong time mm. to want all the merchandise. <laughs> oh, dear. Whoopsie. <laughs> so the three words, what do you think the three words were? One is a mild expletive. <laughs> <laughs> a uh, very well, mild expletive. My mum's three words were bloody Tracy Island. Oh, I, I, I was going to so. say <laughs> Tracy unrepeatable Island, uh, but... Uh... Yeah, bloody Tracy Island. So I think it wasn't the price of one, it was getting hold of one. And then, of course, the Blue Peter make, which I remember as a student we oh, tried yes. to make it as well. 
but it was joyous, wasn't it? I mean, how how old were you then? Well, I'm sorry if you get asked these questions all the time, but you're far more interesting than me, frankly. How old were you then? <laughs> you are, though. This, uh, dis- this, disagree, this, this, and you know, I'm sure some of you know, our listeners would as well, strongly, right? No, 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 they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't hear. Sorry if you have asked this before, but when did you first have sort of consciousness that your dad was who he was to other people? Oh, well, so not until that resurgence. So uh, I was born in 85. Oh, uh, okay. So I was 14. So I was probably watching Scarlet when you were born. Okay. That's ah, cool. Perfect. There yeah. you go. So in the late 80s, we had some VHS copies of Thunderbirds and, uh, you know, from Channel 5 video. Okay. And uh, I would watch them and I kind of really enjoyed them. Terrorhawks, I kind of knew Dad had something to do with it because we had bits and pieces from the series around the house. Nothing, no puppets or props, but the original wooden shapes for Hudson, the, the Rolls Royce, and for the cubes, uh, Zelda's <gasps> cubes. So I, I knew there was something there. But when I was about four or five, my mum said to me one day when I was watching, I think, Attack of the Alligators, she picked up the VHS and said, you know, your father made this. <gasps> and... But at four or five, you've got no Dum. concept of what that means. No, so I, I actually thought that she meant that he'd recorded it off the telly and then made the sleeve. Because oh, yes. you don't you don't think, oh, there's hundreds of people that put, go together to make this. And so it wasn't really until the resurgence, 91, 92. So, you know, it was early school days for me. And suddenly my friends were watching Thunderbirds. And I knew somehow that my dad had made it, but I didn't know when or how or anything like that. And then their parents were bringing in TV 21 annuals from the <gasps> 60s for the friends to give to me, to take home to get signed by dad and return to them. So then I suddenly got an impression that, you know, he was respected and had done something that meant something to people. But even then, you know, you're too young to appreciate it. Yeah, you but are. But really, That's it was true. only... When he did Space Precinct 94, 95, and I was able to go to Pinewood Studios and see it all going on and see how huge it was and what it actually meant to make a TV show. And then finally, with all the, with all the resurgence of the Supermarination shows, it, it actually meant something. God. It took a little while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to imagine what it's like to sort of grow up with that. And yeah, I think he's made that video in the nice cover. Oh, that's clever of him. And then go from that to going to Pinewood, this iconic studio, and seeing yeah. your dad make a show like that. Wow. It was very cool. Wow. It was really, really cool. And do you know what? This is, this is quite embarrassing, but I love Space Precinct, obviously, because I was, you know, I was there. Some days I was in the, the, the model shop, sat between Richard Gregory, who'd done a loads of stuff on Terror Hawks and went on to do Walking with the Dinosaurs, who was making the animatronic prosthetics, and Christine Glanville, who was head puppeteer on Thunderbirds and Scarlet and was you know an amazing expert they were both such lovely people and I was just there kind of absorbing their expertise and seeing how they worked and it was just just an amazing experience did it make you want to do it yourself do you ever forgive me if you've now I do live at the bottom of Tasmania if you're now going to reveal you are you've run 27 BAFTAs I apologize here and now not but- quite yet really no <laughs> no so again this is I'm not going to turn this into an interview uh, that you're uh, hosting with me no but I'm just genuinely <laughs> thrilled and interested uh, Sorry. M- most of the fans will know but if they if they don't I've always wanted to follow in dad's footsteps from the age of four or five or six as soon as I realized okay. that you could make these things I was like I want to do what you do he was very anti that for a long time and pushed me away from the industry in a protective way because he'd had such a rough time on and off and only in the last sort of year six months of his life said you know actually it's a shame you didn't join the family business we worked on a a kind of contemporized prequel type thing to Thunderbirds called Gemini Force One a book series and then I took over and uh, we We've got several shows in various stages of development, financing, et cetera, et cetera. Now. You're, doing, you're doing Space 1999, aren't you? You're remaking well, the, it. Well, the audio, audio drama, yes. So uh, yes. Break, Breakaway is out on the 13th of September, being Breakaway Day. I mean, you're giving me all these cues to promote our bits and pieces, right? It's brilliant. Thanks very much. <laughs> guess, guess, what, guess what I did for 13 years? A PR or something, marketing, selling stuff? Uh... <laughs> Bit of both. Radio. Uh, Oh, radio. Okay, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Makes well perfect sense. In, <laughs> flicking the goal in. Passing yeah, well, the ball, ball and click, clicking it in the goal. Thanks for but that. Yeah, okay. oh, in that case, you won't have seen Firestorm, will you? So no. 
we've taken super marination to the next level as ultra marination and uh firestorm is kind of thunderbirds meets captain scarlet on steroids and we're uh we're busy <gasps> working away on bringing that to life there's a mini free mini episode a proof of concept on youtube so you can go and look at that afterwards i will go and look uh, because like i say i do miss a lot down here and it's quite sad sometimes because i think obviously through technology you can keep in touch with basically everything and everyone that's going on in britain but I do miss quite a lot as well. And I miss stuff that, you know, is of real significance to me because, you know, for whatever reason. So thank you for telling me. It's good to know. And I'll go and put it down. Well, she's a fan. Yeah, I'll say. Oh, big time. Yeah. Lovely yeah. to hear. So never pick a fight with Ray Earl about Captain Scarlet because <laughs> right. you'll be shouted down <laughs> Mr. On style. That's right. Yeah. But no, she just, again, different person's perspective yeah. on... On a show, I mean, I don't mean to be sexist in any way no. here, but generally, Jerry Anton's shows skew bought massively male. Yeah. You know, I think if I look at the gender split on our YouTube channel, yeah. the subscribers are 99.8% male, right. for example. Yeah. So to find someone who's female yes. and also really loves a Jerry Anton show is awesome. Absolutely. And that'd be much appreciated by our, uh, our podster on Facebook uh, group females of which there are many who post lots of lovely pictures and thoughts and all sorts so yeah. yes i'm sure they will love to be represented a bit more it's just finding yeah, them isn't exactly it? it's exactly yeah. that yeah but ray's a great uh, representative of captain scarlet fans yes. uh, regardless of gender and uh, as i have mentioned in previous podcasts we will be playing snog marry avoid with the members of spectrum <laughs> in the next part of my chat with ray which you can hear in Pod 71. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, don't forget we've got an interview with Alex Bell, oh, who's yes. one of the QI elves mm. coming up mm-hmm. in Pod 72 and 73. Yeah. And after that, I'm not entirely sure because I can't remember what we've recorded and what we haven't. No. Well, but there are other things lovely. too. That's great. Now, don't forget, coming up, we have Chris Dale's randomizer, of course. Now, Jamie, I'm looking forward to the um, Podster on Presenters Snog Marry Avoid that we'll be doing at the uh, podcast uh, Christmas party this year. <laughs> <laughs> Me, you, and Chris. Well, where- where Terry actually has to go through <laughs> with all of the things he decides. Let's yeah, film it, Terry put it on YouTube. That'll work. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. did you listen into our Facebook Live broadcast, uh, also broadcast on YouTube and Twitch and Periscope? Last week, uh, Fab Live, uh, we showed some mock-ups <laughs> that we rather enjoyed from uh, our Facebook group that Simon had uh, put together of Jamie as Joe 90 and me as Barry Moore from Space 1999. Uh, quite horrific. And that led me to think, what part would you like to have played, dear listener, in any Jerry Anderson series? Or in the playground when you were growing up, if you were ever playing Jerry Anderson series or whatever, what, what part did you play? I would like to know. Do email in podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. What parts would you like to have played in any Jerry Anderson series? And if you ever played uh, Jerry Anderson games in the playground, what part were you? Who did you play? Did you do the puppet Good question. Walk? Well, and not a day went by when I was at school without somebody doing the blooming puppet walk. No, unfortunately. of course, so, that's right. <sighs> thanks for bringing that up, Richard. Sorry about that. Scarred, yeah, scarred memories. Anyway, yeah. uh, one last thing before we head over to Chris Dale, I must remind you at home, of course, to subscribe to us on whichever channel you're listening to us on. Don't forget to rate us and review us and subscribe and share us with your friends so they can hear us too. That would be splendid. Please do those things. It's time for the yes. second machine of the podcast. Slightly Isn't bigger, it weird slightly that we've got two machines? <laughs> and it's got a bigger redder button it than has. yours. Yes, it really has. <laughs> yes, I can see it from here. Well, uh, let's go straight then into Chris Dale's rather marvellous randomizer. And if you take my advice, there's nothing as nice as messing about on the river. <sighs> Well, this is very nice, isn't it, Marina? A good idea of yours to ask Admiral Denver if we could come along on his fishing trip. And of course, that means he'll be making the randomizer selection today. Once he wakes up, of course. Mm. Gee, I must have dropped off. (laughs) Only four hours ago. It's getting a bit rocky, isn't it? Looks like there's a pretty large fish around here. I'd better check the line. Oh, I think you'd better look behind you. It's got Admiral Denver! It's got Admiral Denver! It's got... It's got the randomizer! It's got the randomizer! We're going to do something! Well, I don't know, hit it with the aura or something! No, give it here! You hit it! Hit it! It's... It's gone! The randomizer... That thing just swallowed the randomizer! Well... I guess that's it then. No more randomizer. 
Oh, Marina, really? That's disgusting. It, well, it wasn't you? Oh, it was the monster. Look, oh, look, it, it's burped up an episode selection printout. Oh, catch it, catch it. Ah, that's it. Well done. Oh, this is all very stressful. Right, we need to get the randomizer back. And what? Oh, and uh, Admiral Denver too, of course, yes. Right, Marina, I'm putting you in charge of Operation Retrieve. Your mission is to recover both of them from the belly of that beast. No, no, there's no need to say anything. I have full confidence in your... What, what you want me to come along as well? Oh, no, 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 I, I couldn't possibly. I mean, I have a very important mission of my own to carry out, actually. What? No, I absolutely do. It's right here on the printout. Look, it's even got an Operation code name. It's Operation SAS. Here's Terrorhawks. Get going, Marina. So, we're back in the world of Season 1 Terrorhawks. This takes place midway through the first production season. I think it was like the second or third um, shown in the UK from the, uh, the second broadcast season. And straight away we have a, a very nice, ambitious opening of this uh, World President's Space Shuttle about to launch. There's a... A few reused props lurking around the place. As we enter the last few seconds. And a lovely close-up on the, uh, the the shuttle itself and the, the launch platform. Again, it doesn't quite reach the levels that you'd be used to in, in say, UFO or even, even Thunderbirds. But for a team that were working with a lot less money the first to venture into space. and weren't all as experienced. It's a very impressive shot. This it's a shame we don't really see much more of that. Some really. good publicity. Well, that may be so, but while the president and his PR circus joyride round the earth, Terrahawks' hands are tied. And I think this is we also the only mention of a world president in Terrahawks. I know that was a big thing in in Captain Scarlet, but it very rarely crept into any other shows. Dorf is Zelda to walk right through. But yeah, the only reason he's gone up is, as with many things in, um, particularly first season Terrahawks, there was always some reason why. We couldn't open fire on the on the Z for whatever. Oh no, the president ship is in the way. Oh, there's a freighter in the way. There's something in the way. Oh damn, we have to let them through. At this very moment, the president circles the Earth. Even the accursed terror hawks cannot go near the president's ship. We can fly to Earth in perfect safety. It's interesting though that their plan that they that the Martians have recognised this is a, an opportunity. But they don't see it as, like, an opportunity to say, I don't know, kill the president, who's, like, right there. No, 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 we'll, we'll just use it to sneak through to Earth and ultimately hatch what's going to be a relatively low-key, even for this show, evil plan. But we'll get more to that when it comes. We can't go on like this. What shall we do? I think it's better we go our separate ways. All right. Stay bright. I adore that moment. I don't know why, because it's so utterly cheesy. And the music is is it's a lovely melody, but again it's it's that slightly 80s synth noise that again just makes it just a little bit cheesy, but I I really like the relationship between Kate and Hawkeye, and I wish the show had focused on it more, but these two are such good friends. Um obviously yeah, Hawkeye just kind of disappeared into the into nothingness through the the second the production season. On. Great. Let's get to the song. As did 5-5 five five there. We just saw 5-5, five five, the rhyming zero. Ash heaps, mother. I can't take her with me. Why are you letting young star go alone? Oh, poor he sister. I like that she's worried about young star. He needs a commander. Yeah, obviously you Someone can't let young star go on his own. Experience. And with extraordinary powers over metallic objects. <gasps> oh, we know who that means. Not him. Anyone but him. Yes, just as we, uh, our last trip to Terrorhawks introduced us to SRAM, Lord of Felony, we're now getting our first randomizer look at. Quick leader. Come forward, my furry, a Napoleon. Yuri! Yuri the space bear. Have you ever seen anything so grotesque? Oh, he's so cute. Keep away from me, you monstrosity! 
And I know that's the point. I know that he's meant to look extremely appealing. And uh, thus sort of tricking you into not expecting him to be a threat. He's bending my ferret. He's bending my ferret. <laughs> but it is, I think it's a very well-made puppet anyway. The thief is prepared. Oh, I, lo I, I love as well Zelda's respect for her monsters. Which I don't think gets enough recognition, but like with Yuri, she's always calling him the hairy Napoleon. And Sram and uh, Lord Tempo, it was always my lord, such and such. Very rarely did she yell at them for failing. Lieutenant, we won't be able to open fire. Oh, what is the excuse this week, 101? It's Azif, but we had to let it through. 10-10, hero. Tiger doesn't even ask why. At this point, it doesn't matter. It's just expected. Oh. Expected. Ah. Aha, you out-thunk me there, I think. Not sure what happened there. Anyway. Oh, Yuri and Youngstar have landed their Zeef at this uh, abandoned country house. Place guards and unload the Zeef. Oh, we have cubes as well. No place to bring my plan to fruition. Oh, and it's an epic plan too. Yep, yeah, so young star Yuri and a load of cubes in one Zeef. Rather chilly. Zeefs aren't that big. Standing here too long. You've been here before. Have I? Oh, yeah, I mean, I have, yeah. Okay, right, yeah, well, amazing. Um, but I just don't seem able to remember, you know? Did you remember the... And that's a, a subtle nod to the way this episode is going to end. And I think also, um, it possibly hints that there were, that this is not going to be Stu's first encounter with, uh, with the Martians. That maybe this kind of thing has happened before and they've wiped his brain... Maybe more than once, I don't know. I mean, it could be just Stu's natural daffiness that he has been there and he really just didn't notice. But uh, I think you're supposed to take the hint that they've something else has happened and they've had to wipe his mind. Which, spoiler alert, is what's going to have to happen at the end of this episode as well. Another very odd inclusion of a Kate Kestrel song is she's singing this to Stu to the backing track in the back of Hudson while the Zeef is closing in on them. Hey, uh, was that like a, um, you know, a backfire or something? I get that they've, they've managed to include it as part of the story for once this week rather than going to Andabo Records and sitting there for like two or three minutes, but. Was an explosion back. I, I, yeah. It's a very nice song as well, and it's one I don't think we heard too often on the show. Hey, look, I, I don't want to be uncool about this or anything, man, you know, um, but we don't seem to have a driver. You know what I mean, Miss Cattrall, yeah? This is, I think, as well, the beginnings of um, Terrorhawks realising what it had in terms of characters, because this was around the point where particularly Stu Dapples and Dee's Wheat were really coming into their own. And I think... This is maybe the third or fourth appearance of Stu, but already you can hear that Robbie has 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 altered his performance to something a bit more. Um, I think the phrase that Stu uses in Play it Against Rome is over the top, you know, O T T. But it's it's such a fun character. Anyway, young star Zeef. Again with the landing legs. Okay, yeah, uh, fine, right? Okay, well maybe. It's forced Hudson off the road. And you know, get some help. Stay where you are. Oh. Don't move a muscle. Oh. <laughs> this is food. It's disgusting. <laughs> so, at some point during the advert break, filled with dead animal flesh, having having want? caught Kate and Stu. Young Star has apparently nipped out to um, to get a takeaway. A producer, yeah. <laughs> There's a brown paper bag, and Yuri keeps looking into it. This is brilliant. Anyway, it's yet another fiendish plot to discover the location of Hawknest. Kate's in serious trouble, but we're doing all we can. What? What exactly are you doing? This chamber 
is capable of inducing unbelievable pain. Oh, you brought Moid. In addition to yourselves and the cubes, you've also brought Moid's torture chamber along? this pain. Oh, oh, was this was this already part of the house? Was this some? Uh, did this house used to belong to some um, uh, dominatrix who's no longer with us, and it was just conveniently left behind all her uh, torture equipment? Terrorhawks, terrorhawks, terrorhawks. Um, I know. Are they one of those really, you know, amazing new heavy Asian groups, man? Yeah. <laughs> a guy with a bear on a lead walked into a sandwich bar. The owner described him as real old, real ugly, and real weird. The guy asked for a sandwich. And get this, he wanted real sand. Where's that station? Okay. Just outside North Town. So... Let's go. Uh, wait, North Town where? You're in South America, remember? Check out the area, hero. Search over a 50 mile radius. 10, 10, Doctor. Oh, so Young Star's hunger has proven to be his undoing. If only he hadn't stopped for takeout during the kidnapping. Oh dear, will he will he ever learn? This powder from the walls is quite palatable. <laughs> no, because he's eating pieces of the wall. We are ready to begin. You'll get nothing from me. So Kate's now strapped into the torture chamber, and it, it is odd seeing seeing any of these human terror hawks puppets sitting down it does highlight how how bizarre the proportions are they have big heads big hands really small bodies hey miss miss kestrel you know i really think you know maybe you should talk so yeah going back to young star's plan it is very it's very low key considering that we know he wants to impress zelda with some kind of master plan i i get that he's sort of low and hit them hard twigged that Kate has a, a secret house and that he can ambush them en route to uh, to and from Antibear Records. But... Yeah, it, it doesn't... It doesn't feel as, as epic a plan as it perhaps should. Just two hostages in, a, in an abandoned house. Oh, I adore that shot of Battlehawk cruising over the top of the house though. You see right up the, the belly of the thing. You can see the battle tank uh, lodged underneath. Showing me won't stop the attack. Surrender while you're still in one piece. All right, lads. Open fire! Yeah, I love that Zero's first inclination is to open fire on this house where they know it's Miss Kestrel, sir. That Miss Kestrel... Yeah. He's likely being held. Space fire, tiger. Brave girl. Yeah, and so awesome that she's like, no, keep going, keep firing on us. Flatten the house. Then you will kill the woman hostage. I love Kate. There's keep very little firing. that can flap Kate. Keep clear of Kate. Yeah, keep. Continue fire. Keep clear of Kate. Just blow the entire house that she's in apart. That's fine. Whoa! Because those charges from the battle tank aren't uh, aren't the uh, the weakest. Anyway, Yuri's going to have a go at them, and they've crashed. It's telekinesis. We're in trouble. Uh, tell you who saw? The ability to bend metal objects with the mind. Whoever's doing it must be taken out. I always loved when when Yuri used his telekinesis against the Terrorhawks, and they would always go, "Whoever's doing this, they're very naughty." Even though they know that Zelda has Yuri, they know his name. They've known what he can do. They know that he was reclaimed. Oh, actually, he wasn't reclaimed. They sent him back to her, didn't they? I saw. I mean, it's so. And yet they always act surprised. And who could it be? You ever heard of the SAS Zero? The SAS? Anyway, Tiger's trying to convince Zero to mount a rescue via the sewer, and I've always wondered if the design on the underside of this sewer lid is that meant to be the logo of the Empire from Star Wars? I keep staring at it, and I I think it is, but it's not a hundred percent there. I don't know. Maybe more more qualified Star Wars fans than me can uh, clear that one up. Sacre bleu! Where is all this leading? Just follow your nose. 
That is not hard to do. <laughs> Keep rolling, lad. So again, yeah, I think with this episode, we firmly established that Dee's wheat is Zero's second in command. Then they went through a few characters again, 5-5 five, five, the rhyming Zeroid, and 2-1 the stuttering Zeroid, and maybe a couple of others. But of course, we had to end up with, uh, with Dee's wheat, and it's a wonderful contrast between the two of them. I always love Dee's wheat. Mew is hearing some strange noises from the toilet. What could that be? There we go, I think the first and only exploding toilet in the Jerry Anderson show. And <laughs> Yuri's been taken out by the toilet seat. Because if you were in any doubt that this show um, was meant to be a... Or wasn't meant to be a, a, a silly thing, it's very silly. Now we've been defeated, having... Teddy bears defeated by Your toilet seats. Friends out cold. Ah. It's all over, Android. Oh, so Zelda's reclaimed the uh, Moid's torture Zelda chamber. Reclaims her own. That shoots my dominatrix theory down in flames. That's Yuri gone as well. There goes your furry friend. Maybe she doesn't want you, Sunny Boy. Oh, poor Don't old young star. Again, this is a, a, a transition point as well for Youngstar. He started out as very devious, very cunning, and around this time, he's still got that element. He's still trying to prove that, but he's also far more the snivelling, oh, mother, help me, character that, that he eventually became. Stew? Stew dapples. So now we have a fairly... dapples? Wipe his memory for the last 24 hours. What I think is a fairly unpleasant way to end the, the story. Kate's taken Stu back to Hawknest. We're going to wipe his brain. Specifically the last 24 hours. No driver. I mean, far out. And I know we have to do this to maintain the continuity that Stu doesn't know anything about what Kate's doing. But I, I don't know, things like this. And I think, as I said recently, regarding the Secret Service as well, when you have a dynamic, a setup for a show that involves some of your main characters keeping other main characters in the dark for the whole series... It's not a, it's not a, in, uh, not a premise I'm entirely comfortable What's with, to be honest. Stu? What kind of a weekend did you have? Weekend? Oh yeah, right. Um, well, I don't remember too much about it actually. You know, I mean, uh, I think it was probably one of those amazing, mind-blowing non-events. Yeah, mine too. Oh, poor Stu. And Stu as well. That, that goes to show he was prepared to work on weekends. I know he has a, a bit of a thing for Kate, so he'd probably do anything for her at any time. But uh, even so, poor old Stu. Anyway, that was Operation SAS. And, you know, I when I saw this come up, I, was, I wasn't I was too too keen to do it. Because I think there are a couple of episodes around this point in the show. Ten Top Pop is another one where it's a very similar premise. And having so many of them around the same point in the show's run kind of, kind of weakens all of them. But this one on its own... Yeah, very very enjoyable stuff. Again, a bit of a bit of a weak plan, a bit of a weak setup to get the young star and Yuri to Earth. But once they're there, great fun. Of course, Yuri is always a uh, Yuri is always great fun. It's always great fun to see uh, any of Zelda's monsters. And um, yeah, again, I think it's it's an it's an important transitional element for a lot of characters. I think young star Dee's Wheat and Stew, who are all all becoming more increasingly important to the show. Terror Hawks! Yeah, well, that's why Chris couldn't quite comprehend his chance choice, because he loves a bit of Terror Hawks. Yes, that's right. And this is an episode which I watched repeatedly as a kid. Yeah. Because I had, had the VHS, and I fondly, fondly, fondly remember the Zeroids blasting up through the toilet in the place where Kate is being held hostage and the, the pieces of toilet landing and the seat coming down <laughs> around Yuri the bear's neck. Oh, of course. For some reason, they're just stuck in my mind. It was yeah. It was when, because it was this kind of beginning of the second series, it's when Terox had found its feet and was becoming funnier uh -huh. and, you know, kind of mocking itself to some degree. Yes, And yes. so I think that's why, as a kid, I, I really, was really drawn to that. Yeah, great. 
Ah, well done. And Chris, Chris clearly enjoyed it too. Quite right too, yes. To some degree. Ah, thank you for that, Chris. Do join us next week for another fantastic randomizer. Now, over on Twitter, there's an account called The Ringer that tweeted, on this day 13 years ago, Dexter premiered on TV. But what TV show beats Dexter for the worst ever ending? Robert replied, Captain Scarlet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Well... The problem is very few of the Jerry Anderson shows actually had a proper ending yes. because they were always hoping to be doing more episodes. Yeah. So the last episode is not an ending no. really for any of them. That's right. So I don't think you can really judge Anderson shows Fair on enough. endings no, like that as such. Yeah. Do you? No, no, you're quite right. Now finally, before we go, Lost in Transition, uh, following the fantastic Barry Gray archive interview from uh, Pod 69... Tweeted uh, Fireball XL5, Thunderbirds, Joe 90, Captain Scarlet, UFO, and Space 1999 Year One as his top five Barry Gray themes. He says, in that order, other opinions are available. To which Ray Earl <laughs> replied, My other opinion is coming. Oh, or it may have just been. <laughs> <laughs> but you can hear the second part next week. I'm sure she'll be uh, talking more about the music if she didn't indeed mention it in the first part. I think she did. Anyway, I've just remembered another piece of news, which I should have mentioned in the news bit, right. but I'm now going to mention now. Yes. The Jerry Anderson World Cup is happening oh, right now. Oh, yes. We're trying to find the ultimate winner, the, you know, the very best Jerry Anderson show, which a lot of people think they already know what it is, and they're saying, well, what's the point doing yeah. it? Because it's going to be Thunderbirds. Well, it might not be. Yeah, that's right. You might be surprised. Yeah, that's right. We've been surprised with some of the results so far uh-huh. already. And if you want to get involved with the Jerry Anderson World Cup, just go on to Twitter and search the hashtag GA World Cup. And you can vote for your favourite. The first rounds are best of... It's a group of three. The winner in the run-up goes to the next round. And then it's it's one-on-one all the way through to the final. Yeah. So um, go and vote for your favourite. If, you, if your favourite is not involved in one of the groups, it may have already been. It may be still to come. But just each time, vote for your favourite of the ones available. And we will get there to find the ultimate winner via Twitter. How exciting. Can't wait. No, nor can I, Richard. Yeah. Let's, it'd be really interesting if there was a, an outlier that won. Yeah, yeah. Like, or at least imagine the, the upset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in all likelihood, it's going to be Thunderbirds versus Space 1999 for the final, isn't it? I I couldn't possibly say. As we speak, Jamie, I am actually setting up dozens of uh, fake Twitter accounts so I can vote for Space Precinct. Of course you are. It makes perfect sense. Actually, tell you what, Richard. (laughs) Right now, I'm going to challenge you to something. (gasps) Yeah? Go on. So what I want you to do is write down your prediction for the top five... Ah. As we get through the Jerry Anderson World Cup, and based on that, write it down, yeah. put it in an envelope, yeah. seal the envelope, Ooh. and then we'll open them around the final day right. and see if our predictions were correct. Right. I'll You're do the wrong. same here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do that. Definitely. Top five. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I look forward to uh, seeing that. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. We're done. That's it. We're out of Finished. here. We've got things to do. Yeah. You've got hair to wash. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah. You've got a plane so, to catch. I, I do. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> lots of out. So, right. Yeah, I better pack my bag. I've got to find my passport and stuff. Yeah. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Rate us. The rating is really, really important. We hugely appreciate it if you do that. And it might even help me find my passport. So, thanks in advance. <laughs> you never know. And we'll see you yeah, next exactly. time. See you in pod 71. Bye. Goodbye. Let's go. Spectrum is green. So have you packed yet? No! Well, I can see your passport on the shelf behind you there, Jamie. That's not my passport, Oh, you're going to take the, little uh, red book. that little fab one as well? Put that in your pocket I'm, for good luck. I'm taking Thunderbird 2 with me. Are you? Because every time I go, I always take Thunderbird 2. Yeah. And I think oh, I can do some photos of it, like, oh, you know, yeah. arriving yes. at the airport. And, the, and, I, and then I always forget. Well, as you're going to Cannes, you could even have the palm trees, couldn't you? I'm not sure I can make them no. tilt down. You could lean against one and just sort of push it over no, a bit. But I'll try and get a photo of Thunderbird 2 on the Quasette, which is the main bit with the trees oh, and stuff. I thought it was a little pastry that you have for breakfast. Uh, 
hopefully I shall also be consuming plenty of croissants uh, while I'm there <laughs> and try not to put on too much weight. Anyway, yeah, I better go and pack and go to France All right, now. Go on then, off you go. So thanks. Yep. Bye. See you next week. Bye. 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 You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun?